uh, this episode. Okay, Me so too. we got something special here. So, Elliot, you've seen thousands and thousands of deals. Um, I've probably seen maybe a little less than that, hundreds of deals. And what we thought would be fun is take a deal and let's uh, do a deep dive in just the, the listing uh, and just do what we would do on a due diligence standpoint and how to evaluate something that doesn't have a lot of information. So we purposely picked, we have a software company. I'll do a brief intro about this, Elliot, and then we sure. can dive in. Uh, Perfect. Just keep in mind, we've changed the industry, we've changed the numbers uh, from a multiple. So all the numbers and margins will still, the, mar- the numbers are different, but the margins are the same, and the industry is different. But most everything else is similar to a software company. So, And uh, for the listeners out there, this is a software company that was for sale, uh, but not anymore. But anybody listening to this probably won't be able to tell what business this is, right? So we've got to mask most of the data. Um, I'll do a brief intro, and then we're just going to rip on this and go back and forth of how we think about this type of an opportunity. Um, so first off, it's a business-to-business software. It helps small businesses communicate with their customers online, through mobile, and kind of a variety of methods. Um, the revenue was about seven fifty, is like seven fifty four. Uh, the profit was three twenty five, so it gives you about 42 percent margins um, in terms of the net. I think they had 500 customers and many are actually white labeling the software. Uh, and uh, how it's set up right now is just there's there's an owner, one owner, and one engineer. There's no support. doesn't really require a ton of support. Uh, and I believe the dev is actually staying on board, or at least there's an opportunity to keep the dev on board. That's always a big thing we think about software companies, Elliot, I'm sure you see a lot, is when the owner or the head person is doing all the dev and then they decide to leave and move on. Okay, right. so I think the, uh, the dev is staying on board. Um, churn is about 13%. What we don't know is, I don't I don't know if that's monthly or annual. If it's monthly, that's really quite high. I think it's annual. Uh, so that's not, that's not too bad with this smaller B2B software space. You really want to be in the churn rate of, you know, sub 20 and if they're at 13 for the whole year, that's actually pretty good. Uh, the lifetime value of the customer is actually 7x what the CAC is, the cost or the customer acquisition cost. Um, so to give you an example, if they spend $100 to acquire a customer, it they get about $700 of revenue, which is really healthy. That's good. It means you can spend a lot of money to actually grow the business. And of course, as we get into the asking price, you're going to chuckle at Elliot, of course, is it's a 3.6x on ARR. So that's annual recurring revenue. So this is actually a, a multiple on revenue, which is not uncommon for... Uh, software companies, but it's also, you know, not necessarily the norm for smaller software companies to right. based on revenue. Right. right. So puts it at about uh, 2.6, 2.7 million. So Elliot, let's just dive in. What are your first initial thoughts when you see something like this? Well, I don't like revenue multiple businesses. Uh, generally, I'm probably more of an old school guy. So my first thing is like, let me, let me put that to the side for a second. Um, okay. However, I do like software, I do like B2B, and I like recurring revenue models. But as soon as I hear recurring, I know that the definition of that is different on lots of different businesses. And people want to call all revenue recurring and not all revenue that's called recurring is actually recurring. So um, I'm having some sort of trepidations there. Um, What I like is that the dev is staying. For for listeners right there, what would be your definition of what's recurring and what's not recurring? So recurring to me is revenue that comes in over 12 months from the same person consistently. Um, if it's not under contract, it's it's at least what's contractual at the beginning. Um, what's not recurring is oftentimes if you have a customer that sort of spends with you every month, but it's different amounts and there's no contractual component to it, then a lot of people will call that recurring because it happens on a repeat basis, but it's not really recurring. Yeah, so it's kind of like you've got your set amount and it's, say, it's $200 a month and you're billing up your Stripe every single month at $200 a month. And, you know, it could be month to month at the beginning or maybe it was annual for the first 12 months and then it went month to month. That's your recurring. But if it goes from 200 to 300 to 100 to 250 and back down because they're using different levels of your service, uh, that's more of a service-based company, not software, from my understanding. Exactly. And, you know, from a diligence perspective, you're not going to know that at this point, but it's something to put on your list of things you need to understand before you go too serious with the business. Um, I love that. So, go ahead. 
those are the main things I'm thinking right off the bat before I do anything else. What about you, Ryan? Did anything like stick out to you? Yeah, so I, I like the, the high margins um, and the fact that he's got uh, the customer, the, the, the lifetime value of a customer is 7x, his cap sure. is cost to acquire a customer. Uh, that is fantastic to me. I usually don't see it that high with this type of a, a smaller business, you know, that's, that's doing less than a million a year in revenue. But usually I see their CAC is a lot higher. Um, so to me, that was my first thought is, okay, is I, I would want to know if the owner is a marketer. Because a lot of times what I have found with these smaller uh, uh, softwares is you, you're engineer heavy, but less on the marketing. And so, and I looked at their pricing, and I, I can't remember exactly their price now, but um, I thought they were very underpriced. And a lot of times that's an engineer who's actually coming up with pricing. I'm not trying to knock engineers, but you know they're thinking more of the product and less on the marketing side. And I'm approaching that's like, you know, where where are the levers that I can that I can pull, right? And, right. Uh, I think you could actually increase. I want to say it was like a hundred or 150 bucks a month or something. I think with what you're doing with this type of a software, I think you could in increase. Uh, pricing by 30 to 50 percent pretty substantial and, and maybe yep. you don't do that on the current customers but i think you could do that on anybody moving forward or you know that it will also cut back on your churn in the short term if someone knows that pricing has increased and they have a sweetheart deal and they're not going to be able to get that so exactly. my first thought is i would want to know if, if he's heavy on the product or if he's heavy uh, like as a developer or if he's heavy on the marketing and my gut tells me he's he's a lot more project manager. I know he doesn't develop, but he is an engineer that does, but he's heavily involved in the product, which means I think from a marketing standpoint, there's opportunities there. Yeah, I'd agree with all those things. Um, so if I put my diligence hat on, so two things I think are really important to know for those that are kind of considering, how do you look at deals? So Ryan and I looked at a uh, five or 10 page kind of confidential information memorandum and one year of annual financials and that's what we're going off of so very very limited data but that's typical so what the heck do you do with this so for me you know if i put on my sort of buyer diligence hat i sort of list out the things that i would need to believe and trust to want to pull in a full price offer right because i'm thinking okay if they want 2.6 I can't come in and say a million bucks, right? Maybe I can say a little bit lower, but I can't come in super lower. So what do I need to believe to offer a full price offer? And that's kind of how I think about it. Ryan, do you come at it any kind of different way? Exactly. I was going to say the same thing. Is like, you know, there's going to be a couple, probably two to three points on every single deal that if they're not true or they don't hold up, then nothing else matters, right? And so anytime the due diligence you want to check off those two to three things as quickly as possible. And I think your, your question of, you know, annual recurring revenue, what's recurring and what's not. And yep. you want to verify the revenue. You know, if they've got 500 customers, we want to make sure they have 500 customers. Because, you know, if you get under the hood and all of a sudden they only have 250, right? Well, right. it doesn't matter anymore. Then you, you want out, right? Right. So I have, before you hire your attorney, before you hire your CPA, before you hire all these things and maybe bring on a CTO to look into the, the dev and the code, what, what are the things that could absolutely kill the deal all the way through the entire deal? And once you verify those, then you start investing a little bit more time and energy and a little bit more. So those are the first things that I would say is like, you know, revenue, make sure it checks out. They actually have the amount of customers that they say, mm -hmm. define what is their churn and what is their annual recurring, def what's their definition of recurring revenue? Yep. I think that's totally right. I mean, you don't have enough financials to know if that's solid. So you need to go get a diligence professional to help you with checking out the financials. You're not going to know for sure if they're good or not. I think Ryan already talked about revenue and talked about the number of customers. The other piece that struck out to me was a 7x lifetime value to customer acquisition cost. Again, it's very dependent on what somebody includes in their customer acquisition costs. And how do they calculate the customer lifetime value? And a lot of people make, let's call it mistakes with those numbers. And so I'd want to sort of check and see if it's really seven to one. And then Ryan's comment was spot on. If the owner is a marketer, then he's wearing two hats. If that person's going away and you're going to run this and you're not a marketer, you got to pay for that marketing mind. And so a portion of that person's salary should go into a customer acquisition cost. But likely it's all, it's probably just direct costs they spent in marketing, not labor. It would be my hunch. 
Yeah. I think this is a, a very common, in, uh, I don't know specifically on this deal, right, but I see a lot of deals where, where Elliot, you've got a developer or somebody who comes in, builds a software for two years, they get the shiny object syndrome and move on to the next opportunity. Yeah. It's hard to know if, if they get the shiny object syndrome because it got difficult and competition right. is really fierce and this right. is actually a crazy space. They're going against a bunch of VC money that can lose as much as they want to get to their, they're looking at growth, trying to get to their series B and series C. Right. Or does he really have the shiny object syndrome and he just moved on to the next thing and he kind of got bored. And I think that's, I don't know of a good way to do that other than just got to get on a call with the seller. Because that's a very important thing when you get into software, right? Yep. Not that everybody who's VC back wins, but you know, if you can spend you know, a few hundred bucks to acquire a customer, and a VC back company can spend a few thousand dollars to acquire a customer, you probably aren't going to win. So let me tell you about street level diligence. Because <laughs> in this case, you can't really trust the seller because you're going to pay them two million bucks if you believe them. So they have a huge incentive. I talk a lot about like. At the time of sale, even an honorable person has a huge incentive to lie when you're paying them, you know, four to 10 times the lie. So people think about diligence as let's go do all this amazing analysis and go read an industry report and do all this kind of stuff. You might just want to go to like, in this case, you should go become a customer of the company. See what their on-take process is, intake process is. See how clean they are in that. See who, what are their competitors. Don't always ask them because they're going to give you the ones that they're clearly beating. Go look for the same service somewhere else. And you may want to spend a little bit of money, 150 bucks for a month. That's not crazy. Most softwares have an introductory period. You may want to go try out a couple of them so that you know personally how are the different services in this arena. And to your point, Ryan, let's go back to revenue multiples. I'm not going to go into valuation because I'll put somebody to sleep. But revenue multiples are for quickly growing companies. If you're paying a revenue multiple today, you have to believe that for the next five to 10 years, this business will be able to grow. And if you get into like you're trying out different softwares and either it looks like it's a commoditized thing that's going to go out of style or new things are kind of similar that could be cheaper or you just don't think this thing's going to grow at a fast pace, then even though other people are willing to pay a revenue multiple for this, you may be more skeptical because you don't see the growth. I, I would second that. I think uh, most people like in our shoes, if we're looking to acquire a company, we're not VC backs or a private equity firm where we can just, you know, we're, we're, we're paying for uh, not necessarily growth, but we're just paying for like how fast can this, can this work, right? right? Like I need to make the numbers work and I need to show profit, right? With any deal that I do. So the instant you have a, a multiple on revenue, the, the focus is on growth and not actual profitability. Right. And a lot of companies can do that if they've backed the right way and there's the right setup and structure. I would say most people who are listening uh, probably can't afford to just go out and buy companies left and right. You know, They're not necessarily raising tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to do that. So um, that, that is something that would probably take it off the, uh, off the, um, off the table from, from the get-go. Let's, let's dive into a little bit more about that street level due diligence. You kind of talked a little bit about becoming a customer, understanding the onboarding process. How would you go about like understanding an actual competitor? Because right, you ask someone, they're going to give you the two or three that they're killing, but they're not going to you know give you the two or three that they're actually worried about. Uh, you know, other than just doing a lot of googling, is there something else that could be done to figure out who their competition looks like, or you know, figure out maybe who one of their customers is so you can actually chat with them? So I'll give two examples. Um, one's universal and one's to kind of get people in the mode of what street level diligence really is. So you can go to LinkedIn. So now that you have the company name, if you were the one that was looking at the company, you would not have the company name. So you can't solicit employees and you can't um, do that, but you can look and see where, if an employee is good in this particular company and they're somewhere else, so look at former people that used to work there, they're probably working at a similar company that might be a competitor. That'd be a great place to look. Additionally, when you go to LinkedIn and search for like the owner or the dev person on the right hand side, they list people also look for those people are probably working at competitors. And then I think Google is a great solution as well. Sometimes you have to get off the first page if it's a smaller software company because they're not going to be like 
the Google of their scenario. They're going to be more of a, a small player. So that's the first example. The second example, how to do street level diligence, and I'm going to use an example that's way away from software, but it's perfect for this. I was looking at buying a concrete company like ReadyMix Concrete when I was working at a private equity firm. And ReadyMix Concrete is interesting because it can only last in a truck about 45 minutes. So all the customers and the competitors are within like a half hour of the shop. And so I was looking at the pricing of somebody's um, concrete. And I wanted to know pricing for concrete. You know, I could call a concrete investment banker and pay a whole bunch of money. Or I just drove to three or four ready mix concrete locations and asked them how much it cost for uh, a ton of concrete. <laughs> Which was very much simple. My boss thought I was, you know, uh, cunning. I won't say anything better than that. But you got to sort of think about, like, get out of your, like, super business. I'm going to 10x this thing hat. How do you get in there? You know what I mean? Like, go take somebody to lunch. Go offer somebody dinner. Go find the OG that's been in the industry forever. Found somebody who's bounced around a lot. Hey, I'll send you a hundred dollar wine dot com gift card to get you know half hour of your time. I mean, I think if it's your money you're putting up, go go figure it out. Yeah, this is you know, like you said. This is a two and a half million dollar deal, right? What's what's a few hundred bucks to sign up for the software? Uh, drive around for a couple hours to, to understand these things. Uh, what I have done is in, in situations like this is you can find out, you know, competitors, but also you just want to find similar companies that are similar size. So, you know, in your concrete example, right, or your, your ready-made concrete, you know, you drive around and you can see the, comp the competition. I've also jumped on LinkedIn or just jumped on other associations and just stay here to, okay, if I'm in, you know, Denver, why don't I call someone in Seattle? The industries Great. are going to be extremely similar yes. and there's no crossover. So yes. if I'm talking to someone in Seattle, he's never worried that I'm going to like take business from him. Right? Exactly. Yes. And, and you got to do it in a way where it's like, I'm happy to pay for your time or happy to give you a gift card, wine.com, whatever it is. Right. Uh, you're not trying to just, you know, be a leech and take people's time. But I think people really respect that they're going to give you the time of day. And if you nurture those types of relationships, right, I think a lot of those people can become mentors. Um, and I have seen a lot of people actually turn into investors when you actually just reach out to other people in the industry and say, Hey, I just want some feedback on this. I know I can learn this industry, but I'm just trying not to get myself into a hole from the very beginning. So that's a um, great example. Like if you're nervous about calling a competitor locally, find one way away because they're not going to yeah. think of each other as competitors and you're not going to threaten them. That's a great, that's a great, well, that's a great thing. It, people should really write that down in your notes. When, and the other thing we so let's we kind of go back to software. It's like okay, we got B two B, right? There's a wide range of size. I would actually talk to someone who's a similar size in B two B software, and someone who's also larger. I'd want to talk to some product managers. And I have a background in tech, so you know, that is my my network, so to speak. But also, Elliot, like just jump on LinkedIn and just start. Okay, who's a smaller you know software company that I know, and then say, okay, who manages the product there? And you can even say. Hey, can I can I hire you for three hundred dollars? And if we get further, and you just spend an hour kind of deconstructing this product and tell me what's wrong with it, yeah. right? So uh, it's okay. It, people are willing to be a consultant who aren't a consultant, especially if you're going to pay them a few hundred bucks for their time. And yeah. Maybe that's something you can do a little bit down the road, but you just got to start thinking outside the box because you, you're exactly right. You know, the little lie they tell you now is multiplied by eight x or. 9x EBITDA. <laughs> so exactly. That's, that's, an exactly. that's a uh, big incentive. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just a little lot here, but then you multiply it by me and it gets pretty big fast. Um, you brought up a good point. Know. I mean, and and for listeners, you know, you might be saying, oh, I don't want to spend any money. I'm not actually saying that you even pay the person all the time. Most of the time when I offer to pay for people's time, they don't want the money. They want the signal that I'm not there to be a leech and I'm interested in res like reciprocity and I'm willing to, right? The people who you're calling are probably rich. They don't work <laughs> on a single hour basis. Like your 300 bucks is, you know, it's not going to help him like go buy his next boat. But when you, when you show up to someone in that spirit of reciprocity, it, it, it gets you out of the fray. In, in fact, I don't know if you get a whole bunch of LinkedIn messages. But none of them are offering me any money for my time most days. So somebody who did would get my attention. Yeah, uh, I love that you said that. Yeah, I, I had to just stop checking my 10 messages. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and every now and then someone will finally, you know, figure out my email or whatever, track me down. And, uh, you know, a lot of times the people who do offer me money, I don't accept it, but I do take their call because I know they're serious or they've shown me that they've done some sort of deal as it's up to a certain point. And in this case, right, it's like you can show up to someone, hey, I've done X, Y, and Z on this ready, ready mix concrete business and this software business. Here is what I'm lacking in, and it's A, B, and C. And sure. So you're outlining your exact questions of what you're doing and showing sure. you come there. Yep. Um, Elliot, so I bought a company before that had custom code. You've evaluated probably a lot of businesses. Um, how would you go about, especially if you don't have a technical background, to evaluate this B2B software company on the code level? You know, see, sure. everything's kind of checking out. You're going a little further down the path. You got to check out this code and understand the code tech. And how would you go about that? Sure. So. The cool thing about deals is there's like a sequential order to how you should do things. Um, and depending on how like forward leading your technology is will depend on where this should be in your process. So there's there's always going to be financial diligence of the numbers, right? There's always going to be some legal stuff if somebody's suing them or they subject to a lawsuit, yada, yada, yada. And technology companies is also, is the code any good? But the code being good to me is secondary to are the numbers right? Because the numbers aren't right, I don't care if the code's any good. If the numbers are right, consistent, strong, and growing, I probably care a little bit less about the code, right? Because I'm actually buying the cash flow. So longer preamble, but so you should get your financial stuff done first because great code on a lying set of financials, not relevant. And then you should get an expert. You know, Guardian Due Diligence, we do financial due diligence primarily, but we partner with folks to do the technology stuff. So if you come to us, we can kind of put you in contact with someone to do that. There's other people in the market that do technology diligence really well. The thing that you want to be sure, or the thing that a wise buyer would do is also make sure you're you're biting off diligence that's right size for your deal. So one of the things you got to think about is like, is the juice worth the squeeze? So if it's 50,000 bucks to check the code, you know, you got to find some creative ways to, to sort of get that like set up. Um, if it's more reasonable than price, then you can go get an expert. And then what you want to do is make sure the person who you're getting comes highly um, referred and is reputable because when you're getting diligence in an area you can't check, you're you're really exposed, right? Yeah, I love is the juice worth the squeeze because you could spend endless amounts of money on due diligence, but that's, you know if you're buying a fifty thousand dollar company, right? I, I have a friend selling. Uh, kind of a side project that he'd been working on for a little bit, and it, I think the total price is like 110 grand. Yep. And he was asking me, you know, all these things about attorneys and this and that, and I was like, you know, you know, you're, you're getting 50 percent now, 50 percent over the next two years. It's a pretty small deal. Like, you just got to figure out how much you want to spend on your deal. Do you want to go spend, a, you know, three or four thousand dollars, or just use some off-the-shelf templates? Right. We kind of walked through that, and you know, I told him, I, I've done. Cut corners. Would I recommend my mom to cut corners sometimes? Probably not. But am I rec- you know, I'm not his legal counsel, but I said you just gotta figure out what's it, what's it to you, right? I think when when you take a step back, everything is is kind of evaluated on risk, right? It, like you said, if, if if it's a large, you know, I would say most listeners a two point five million dollar purchase, that's a large that's a large purchase for for a lot of us, right? Yes. This is not some hundred million dollar company buying, you know, an ankle biter competitor. Exactly. So you gotta figure out what, at what point do you feel comfortable with the deal? And then yes. balance that with how much money you can afford to spend on yes. this. And then at the timing of it. And it's an art. Entrepreneurs are the best artists, man. They are so creative. And if, if, if this is like, you know, overwhelming to you, you know, maybe this is like, hey, maybe don't go buy a company. Because yeah. you've got to balance all these different things. And at the same time, you're like, how do I have enough risk that I get, you know, I've got all this upside and I'm buying a great company, but I'm also like, you know, I don't want too much risk to do right. much leverage that I'm not going to be able to sleep at night. Right. right? So it, there's an art to it. So you you said a great set of things there. So when is diligence done is a question I get all the time. Like, when are you done with diligence? Because you can also maybe not spend any money, but take an infinite amount of time. Right. And deals don't allow it. And so diligence is done when you're comfortable putting up two point six million. Right. <laughs> that's that's when it's done. And until you're <laughs> until you're ready to do that. It's not done. And so, um, you know, like uh, uh, sort of career investors sort of know that. And then your risk versus cost 
thing is is funny too because I get a lot of people who call me and say, hey, you know, how do I do half a QOE or how do I get half off or something like that? And I'm like, so do you want like the, the you want the bulletproof vest from like the Walmart clearance rack when you're going to war? Like, you know, we're protecting two point six million dollars of capital and you want you want the you want the you want the you want the Walmart? <laughs> you want the guy in the corner selling it? So well, you don't want markets or the Walmart, yeah. Exactly. Like we're going to big lots here. So you, you you don't want to go too low, but I would admit, you know, going too high doesn't make sense either. I'd also admit that you don't you don't always get um value commiserate with cost. And then you said something else that I thought was cool about like the entrepreneurial mind in the deal process. So Ryan and I have both talked about processes that are you can't write it on one sheet of paper and teach somebody, you know, in five minutes. It's like, how do you evaluate how much to pay for diligence? Or like, how do you know when you're done? And I think what's cool about entrepreneurship too is when you're doing a deal, like any given day, some new piece of data can come to you that totally changes the most important thing for that day. And so entrepreneurs manage that stuff all the time too. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful analysis, but it can be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it, you're supposed to have fun throughout this process too, right? <laughs> so, um, maybe, so a couple of things on this deal here as we as we go back to this this B two B software. Sure. Um, where would you see Elliot? You're looking at this deal. And you see some of the ways of how they're acquiring customers. They don't have a sales team, but you're typically looking at a software company. What are some maybe low hanging fruits that you see for just overall growth? Sure. So. The first thing is sort of is the juice worth to squeeze on a sales team. And then who do I know or who can I find who can anchor that team sufficiently to get it started? Because that's going to be kind of your your all star player. So, you know, adding adding money to um, the sales team. But then the other thing is most of these companies are selling digitally. Most people make pretty significant mistakes in their digital marketing and sales funnels. And so seeing if there's some opportunities to optimize that. One of the big ones is, are they not marketing into channels that have become popular in the past five years, but maybe somebody was asleep at the wheel? So that's something else. The other thing is, are they going to market in all the ways that would make sense? So this company did some 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 white labeling, which is great. But like, are they only regionally focused and you could take them national? Are they um, only U.S. focused and they could be multinational? And are they only in you know, B2B health related businesses and, and they really should expand to pharmaceuticals and some other things. So those are some of the main things that I think about generally right at the beginning. Yeah, I, I would second a lot of those things. And uh, first off, you can tell there was a little bit of digital marketing, but you don't know if it's dialed in, right? And so um, similar to how we evaluate other parts of the business that we don't know, you, you want to get someone that is a good digital marketer. When I have done deals before, I've hire people that I know are really good at PPC or really good at Facebook marketing or, or SEO to give me a, a quick analysis. And I say hire, it might be 50 bucks, right? Because you're really just looking for 20, 30 minutes of your time. Maybe it's maybe it's a lot more, right? And a lot of times I've actually used, uh, like in this digital marketing example, if I'm testing it, I've, what I've done is gotten two or three reports from two to three different agencies. Or sorry, I got one report from two to three different agencies and I have basically told them, like, look, I'm happy to pay you whatever your report is, but based on the reports that you give me and, like, the thoroughness and your ability to teach me what I need to know, I'm going to hire you after I buy this company. There we go. And I have found it's, it's almost the best form of an interview. And um, 100% of the people that we hired on my last acquisition in terms of agencies and freelancers uh, came through on this almost, like, interview. Excellent. Slash deal yep. stage, too. Um, when, That's smart. I would, and, and it just allowed us to kind of have like real world working experience with an agency before you sign up. Because let's be honest, everyone's been burned by an agency, right? And not all agencies are bad, but you know, there's a, a, you know bad apples in the batch that, of course, you know, could contain everything. Well, so, yeah, and, and the reality is, my experience is that people are typically good at one or two things, but market ten. You know, everybody wants to be full service, and not everybody's good at like the whole litany of things that are under the digital marketing umbrella. And so, it's up to you as the buyer of services even to be diligent about um, how do you bring people on? And then you talked about risk sharing earlier, just as we're talking about growth, when you bring on growth partners in any capacity, you should think about how much risk they're taking on around being successful in whatever contract they have. Cause if they have no risk and you're just paying them and there's no, 
there's no upside if they do better and no downside if they do worse. You're putting yourself in a precarious situation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, sometimes you're seeking advice from someone who doesn't have any downside, right? Or they're, they're, they only care about, you know, are you going to pay your bills? And, you know, if they say no, then you, know, you don't hire them or something like that. So you just have to be careful with that. I would say a couple of areas of growth that jumped out to me was first, uh, I, I would actually really think about the price. Uh, I just That's felt like true. it was underpriced. Yeah. That would be something I know we kind of talked about that earlier. And then, you know, I spent years in, in enterprise software sales. Um, I think an underutilized uh, opportunity for growth is actually partnerships or, or like internet marketers call it affiliates. The professional term is partnerships on the software side, whatever you want to call it, right? Yeah. Um, but basically what you do is you want to find people who are already selling to your end customers that yes. don't compete with you. And how do you create a partnership so that it's win-win where you pass the business or, or, or percentage of revenue and they make introductions for you. Right. Um, but you can go out and hire a sales team, like you said, but is the juice worth the squeeze? Probably not, right? Most most times it's not. So what are some other quick ways? In, a, a simple example is um, I have, like say I have a workout uh, PDF or a workout course or whatever. I work out something, a service that I want to sell to people you know, who are looking for like a workout thing. So yeah. I'm going to go find someone who's already selling to them, right? Yes. Uh, and I'm going to go find some dietitian who meets up with me perfectly, and they've got a list of 500,000 people. Yep. And I say, hey, great, let's partner. Send this to your list, and I'm going to hook you up, and I'm going to pay you 40%, whatever the number is. Right. And so that would actually be my form of, you know, how could you throw fuel on this fire? And if yes. you do really check out, is I would really want to dive into who could be the right partnerships. Yes. And I have actually, uh, you have to balance this a little bit too, Elliot, is I've actually reached out to potential partners mm -hmm. and told them, I'm thinking about getting into the industry. I'm thinking about, you know, being in this space and I'm not in it yet. What, what makes you want to work with other partners? Right. right. And so I've actually created the partners before I've actually finished That's smart. acquiring the company. Because if I can't convince them to work with me before, I'm not going to be able to convince them to work with me after. So, um, and I have felt like, you know, say for example, you're like, okay, I know this partner is already on board and this right. one I'm already talking to. You might actually be able to change the financial projections of the business because you know you've got the right partners lined up. And what better place to do that in software where really to add a, add a new customer on, it's, it's just a few pennies, right? right. It's, the code right. is already written, right? right? So you have a lot of flexibility there. Um, We've, we've got a, we've got just a couple minutes left, Elliot. Any anything else you'd add to this deal or due diligence or anything to dive into here? Yeah, and I'll say this quickly and reach out to me if you want to get a fuller the stuff you find in diligence, whether it's financial, technical, legal, are things you should do to their 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 lessons or sort of projects you should do post close to help grow the company. So issue and diligence is opportunity for growth. And so you should be connecting diligence with your growth plan. And like Ryan said, if you're able to get your growth plan started during diligence, actually using some of your growth plan interviews of like agencies, for instance, to actually pre-qualify the company, then you're even better suited to maximize ROI post-close. So from a, a data perspective, that's it. And then, you know, I'm at guardiandiligence.com and you can find all my contact information there. We focus on financial due diligence. And so if that's something that you need, I think we have a unique lens being deal guys that manage CPAs and a bit better um, suited for certain deals um, than a typical CPA firm. Elliot, thanks so much. I was just going to ask you where people find you. GuardianDueDiligence.com. We'll link it out there in the show notes. And uh, thanks for giving your time. I've enjoyed this, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Recording stopped. Dude, that was awesome, man. I thought I so, thought too. that was like... Uh, the, the, the kind of the banter back and forth, like I felt like it was a, it was a good flow.